Watching my son Andrew kick the winning goal. That's my dream. Or catching his eye as he holds the science fair trophy, head held upright with the pride of our triumph. I still remember how my own father looked the night my high school football team won state. Two of my teammates hoisted me onto their shoulders, and when Dad saw me, it was as though he forgave himself for every mistake he's ever made all because he raised me into the man I had become. I don't care what Andrew decides to pursue in life, I just want him to be great at it. Isn't that what all fathers want? He's going to be eight next month. And I know the next generation's best his future competition have already begun to refine their talents. Mozart began playing at three. Picasso could draw before he could talk, and Michael Jackson was performing live by six years old. It's taken a while for Andrew to find his niche, but lately he's started getting really into mountain and trick biking. His mother Amy thinks it's too dangerous, but I know how important it is to be passionate about your skill set. So I encourage him every chance I get. Amy just doesn't understand. She would see one little cut or bruise, and then suddenly, that's all that mattered. I say if you aren't willing to bleed a little to achieve your dreams, then you don't deserve to have them come true. That's why we started practicing in secret. I tell Amy that we were just going to ride around the block. We'd both pedal until the house was out of sight. Then we'd blast off toward the hills wearing the same conspiratorial green. He was good too fearlessly bouncing down cliffs and rocky slopes that would have even given me pause. Every day, he came home a little stronger and a little more confident than the day before. Every day I knew it was worth all the exhaustion and sneaking around because he was going to be the best and I was going to be the one who made it happen. That is, until the day when it wasn't worth it anymore. We'd just gotten home from a trick competition at the skate park, although it was hardly fair since Andrew was still eight and all the other kids were teenagers. Andrew slipped up while trying a nose wheelie and was disqualified before even getting to show of what he'd been practicing. We were both so frustrated, but I was still proud of him for not wasting any time and getting straight back to the hillside to practice. I could tell he wasn't being cautious this time. It was my fault for applauding and egging him on to tackle bigger boulders and obstacles. When you're disappointed, you can either give up or try harder, and I just didn't want my boy to quit. When he asked if I thought he could ramp off a rock to clear the ravine, I told him what I thought he needed to hear. You can do anything you put your mind to, I said. We were wrong for believing in each other. I shouted when I saw his back tire slipping right before he made the jump, but it was already too late to do anything about. The bike pitched forward and hurled him straight over the handlebars, twisting the bike around on top of him as he flipped. Long before I heard the grotesque snapping of his impact, I knew he wasn't going to walk away from this all right. Maybe if I hadn't pushed him so hard, or so soon. Maybe if I hadn't allowed my own guilt and fear to make me hesitate before I plunged into the ravine after him, then maybe I could have saved him. It took a full ten seconds of listening to his agonized groans before I could force myself to gaze down at what used to be my son. He'd landed directly on his head, but the helmet did nothing to prevent his neck twisting halfway around his body under the power of the impact. He'd been jarred so hard that part of his spine ruptured straight through his skin to greet the air with a bloody shine. Screw competing. If he even survived a trip to the hospital, then I'd still spend the rest of my life feeding him with a spoon. But this was my fault and he was my son, so there could never be a choice. I took the first step of the never-ending journey down the slope toward him. Let's go home, Dad. The words should have been enough to bring tears to my eyes, but instead I froze in the grip of absolute terror. It wasn't my son who said it. I didn't even know if my son could talk anymore. I turned slowly, careful not to lose my grip on the pebbled earth and topple helplessly down the ravine. I'm okay, Dad. Let's go, Andrew, or at least someone who looked exactly like my son. All the way down to his freckles and the mustard stain on his sleeve was waiting for me on the top of the hill. Back down the ravine, I still saw the twisted and broken version of the same boy lying there. Come on, the unharmed Andrew said. Raise you back. He hopped on his bike and skidded fearlessly along the hillside. His speed and dexterity surpassed the old Andrew, even on his best days. As beautiful as it was watching him fly over the rocks, the sight was impossible to appreciate with the wet gurgle of coughing blood sounding from further down. I had to make a choice, and judging by the amount of blood pooling on the rocks below, I had to make it fast. I could go down the treacherous slope and lift my son into my arms. I could drag him to the hospital burning through my energy and savings in the vain fight toward a subnormal life. I could explain to Amy that I had lied to her, 
and that it was my fault that our life would never be the same. And if after all that Andrew were still to die, then I know she would leave me and I would have nothing left. Don't worry, Dad. We're going to win next time. I promise. Or I could turn around and leave with... With what? Watching him race up and down the hills. The answer was obvious. I could turn around and leave with my son. And none of this will have ever happened. I'll be right there, I said. First one home gets ice cream for dinner. Climbing up the hill after Andrew after my son it wasn't as hard as I thought it would be. It was abject relief to see his beaming face waiting for me at the top. The only hard part was when I had already lost sight of the ravine and was headed home, only to hear a voice dissipating on the wind behind me. Please don't go. I need you, Dad. I gripped my son's hand, my new son, and held on tight all the way home. For the next few weeks, I wouldn't let Andrew out of my sight. I drove him to school instead of letting him take the bus. I picked him up for lunch, then again when school got out, taking him to his favorite places and spending all of my time helping him practice. I was trying my best to be a good father, and trying even harder not to think about what that meant. I thought about going back to the ravine to at least bury the body, but every time I began to work up enough courage to face that broken corpse, my new son seemed to appear wanting to spend time with me. By the end of the first month, life had gone back to normal and it was like nothing ever happened. The new Andrew was identical to the old, even sharing the same memories and habits and everything. By the second month, I'd even forgotten that horrible day ever passed, although sometimes the echo of those words being torn by the wind still slip into my brain as I lay down to sleep at night. I need you, Dad, but I was a good father. I did everything for my boy, and I knew he was going to repay me by becoming the best biker the world had ever seen. It wasn't until Andrew was 12 years old when I began to notice behavioral anomalies that I couldn't explain. But surely the real Andrew, I mean the old Andrew, he would have had his own changes by this age. I tried to tell myself that he was just starting to go through puberty, but even Amy began to feel that something wasn't right. Do you know what I caught Andrew doing last night? She told me one morning over breakfast. He's going to be a teenager soon. I'm sure I don't want to know. He was eating a buck. She declared, a big shiny cockroach just munching it right up, looking as proud as a kitty cat who caught his first mouse. Then there was the rustling outside our window late at night. A dozen separate occasions, I must have heard it like someone was in the bushes watching us. Amy wanted me to check it out, but I just kept imagining Andrew running through the field like a wild creature, biting the heads of animals or digging up worms. I think I was happier not knowing. It wasn't just that either. Some nights, we'd catch him awake at four in the morning, face an inch from the mirror, just staring at himself and giggling. Another time he had a butterfly knife God knows where he got it and was peeling away the skin on the back of his hand. He'd exposed a strip of bloody muscle and tendons running all the way from the tip of his finger running halfway up his forearm. I took the knife away and demanded what he was doing. But all he said was, just curious what goes on under there. Dad. He grinned when he said dad, stressing the word like it was our shared secret. Neither of us had ever mentioned that day on the hillside but it felt like he not only remembered, but was actively using it to blackmail me. The worst was when he was trying to get something out of me, like when he decided he needed a laptop. I told him to wait for his birthday and turn to leave, but then he replied with, please don't go. I need you, Dad. Those words were burned into my subconscious like a trigger. Whenever he said it, I couldn't even look him in the eye. I'd just cave and give him what he wanted. It's not because he was the boss of me or anything. There's nothing wrong with me wanting to be a good father. All the while, he kept practicing with his bike. He was the best I had ever seen, and anyone who saw him swore the same. He refused to participate in anything big because he wasn't ready yet, but he blew all the local competitions a new one. People started coming from miles around to watch him perform, and as soon as they found out I was his father, I'd have a dozen hands clapping me on my back or offering me a beer. You must be so proud of him, they'd all say. Of course I am. He's my son. This coming weekend is going to be his biggest one yet. Some YouTube personality will be recording the whole thing, and I know the second the world sees what my boy can do, he'll be too big to ever put back in a box. I tried to warn him about how things will change after that, but he wouldn't listen to me. Isn't this what you wanted? He asked. He sat down on his bed, giving me a look of wide-eyed blameless sincerity, as though he was a perfect angel sent here to bless my life. Bullshit hacked. Don't pretend you know what I want. I told him. I was sick of that grin he always wore. 
You go if you want to, but you're going alone. I don't want any part in this media circus. I turned to leave, trying to get out of his room quick enough before he said please don't go. I need you, Dad. I don't know why. But that time, it really got to me. It wasn't. Just a little kid trying to get away with something. This was an active taunt. Manipulation of the highest degree. I thundered back around to face him, hoping to put my foot down and re-establish myself as the authority figure. If I ever hear you say that again, I am going to beat your ass until until what? He interrupted. Until I'm as broken as he was. My breath caught as though someone had reached down my throat and grabbed it from the inside. He's never spoken of the other Andrew before. I'd hope to God he never would. My hands involuntarily clenched into fists, so tight I could feel my muscles trembling all the way up my shoulders. It was never about me succeeding. Was it? He asked, that arrogant grin spreading across his face. You just wanted a little for yourself, didn't you? Only now the light's grown to bright, and you're getting scared. I want you out of this house. Now, I've never spoken like that before in my life, so low it was closer to a growl than words. You sure M.O.M. agrees with you on that? Don't call her that. Get out. I want you con. Throw away one son. And it's his fault. Andrew wasn't backing down. He was standing an inch from my face now. Throw away two. And suddenly it's yours. I threw my fist at his face with everything I got. Maybe I could break his nose. Or knock his teeth out. Maybe I could scar him up anything to make this impostor look less like my son. I hadn't realized just how strong he'd grown though. And when he swatted my fist away... It felt like the bones in my hand were rearranging themselves. Don't be like that, Dad, he said. You wanted me to be the best, didn't you? I grunted through the pain and swung again. My eyes could barely follow the blur of his movements. He locked my outstretched arm against his side. And before I knew what was happening, he'd spun me around and slammed me into his closed door. I tasted blood, and my arm strained so bad against this pressure that it must be about to dislocate. I bit my tongue, trying not to scream. I couldn't let Amy know her son was Amonster. What do you want from me? I had to spit and mumble to push the words through the bubbling blood and the pressed it off frame. He let me go and laughed as I slid to the floor. I'm not like you. I don't need anything from anyone. I just like being on your side of the world. Where I'm from, we don't have families like this. I strained for any sign that the words were changing as he spoke. I didn't want to look, but an irresistible urge forced my head to turn. I wanted him to be a monster. Some horrible grey-skinned ghoul with tentacles, or a dozen gaping maws, anything but what was there. Anything but that mockery of my son which grinned down at me. What are you? I asked. Where are you from? Come with me this weekend, he said, or I'll take you there. It was undeniably a threat. I don't know if he was a demon crawled up from hell, or some spectre from another world too horrible to contemplate, but lying there on the ground in a growing pool of my own blood. I finally understood how powerless my real son must have felt waiting for me. Russell, like something in the bushes outside the window. Then, Nanquum swad me hivana. Sunt mela quay libers. Ips vena bibers. One the voice was coming from outside, sounding so familiar and so alien, like listening to your own voice through a recording. Andrew recoiled as though struck. He snarled, launching himself at the window. Finally, the illusion of his humanity was beginning to shed and beneath the distorting fabric of his t-shirt, I could see the red blisters spreading. The creature roared as it smashed into the glass, but a brilliant light radiated from the panel and repelled it like an electrically charged fence. Exorcismus to omni satanica protesters. I could just make out a hunched shape outside the window, but it was immediately obscured by another blinding flash of light which penetrated through the morphing creature. Boils the size of my head were swelling and rupturing down the length of its back. Black pass flowed freely down its sides. Again, it slammed itself into the window. But this time, it vanished straight through the portal without so much as cracking the glass behind. By the fading brilliance, and without the creature blocking my view, I saw the figure on the other side of the glass. Its back was as twisted and monstrous as the creature who had just been banished, and its face was unevenly stitched together with a network of scars, burns, and unsealed holes which allowed me to see straight through his cheek and into his mouth. Through all the disfigurement and abuse, it was clear that nothing which has happened to him, nothing that could ever happen to him could ever disguise the fact that he was my son. It was difficult to explain, and even more difficult for Amy to understand, but she confessed that she always felt something wasn't right and was relieved to finally have an answer. Andrew, my real boy, told us that the thing was called an irisanct, 
and they exist as powerless swarms of unresolved desires. Sometimes they will find their way to us through minute holes that exist between dimensions, although they remain harmless until they are given power by our acceptance of them. The Irisanct cannot remain here long without taking a form, and even once they are accepted, they can only stay so long as they replace the void they left behind with someone from our side. When I took the creature home as my son, I gave it the strength to banish my true son to the other side, although the recounting of his journey, there is another story altogether. The real Andrew had managed to return four months ago, watching us from the bushes and protecting us against the Irisanct. When I asked why he didn't reveal himself sooner, he said he was waiting for the time when he knew I would accept him as my son. To come back to us after what I had done to him, after everything he's been through pride, does not even begin to approach the admiration I feel for him. He wouldn't stay with us long though, saying there are more of the Irisanct leaking through at an increasing rate. Barely a teenager and already deformed from his injuries and his trial spent on the other side, Andrew is going to keep fighting them, and he's going to be the best there ever was. I watched him go early this morning. I didn't want him to leave, but I know I had no right to speak the words in my heart. Please don't go. I need you, son. Note, my son spoke in decipherable Latin at the time, but he has since taught me the spells which translate to, one, what you offer me is evil. Drink the poison yourself. Two, we cast you out, every satanic power. Thank you for watching. Your support means the world to me. Stay tuned for more content and don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. See you in the next video.